Welcome everybody to another episode of the Power Hour podcast. Uh, my name is Jeff Crudgenton, I'm your host, and today we've got a very, very special guest, a legend in the industry. I'm pretty sure everyone's going to know who this guy is. We've got Mr. James Carl. So thank you very much for joining us, James. Pleasure, Jeff. Pleasure. Couldn't sleep last night. I was <laughs> super excited about a little chat today. James has exited 15 recruitment businesses that he's helped to build from scratch. Right? So he's the founder of the Recruitment Entrepreneur, global success. There's very, very few, I don't know any founders that have had that anywhere near the amount of success that James has had in the recruitment industry. He's an expert at building, scaling companies and creating wealth with his partners. If you want to build a legacy, you want to build something of scale and you want to create wealth, you have to build an institutionally designed business. My first endeavour was, like you say, let's build something of legacy. Let's, you know, I'm going to be the biggest rec rec agency in the world. And I looked at what needed to happen for that. And once I got to four or five people, I realised I'm not very good at management. <laughs> right? So are you better off? You know, so if you take Amazon today, you know, Jeff Bezos probably owns less than 10% of it. I, I'm in love with recruitment. It's not that like I love what I do. I'm in love with recruitment. It saved me from a, a life where it was, you know, not going well. Recruitment was my lifeline. And to be fair, Jeff, it's not easy. And it goes back again to the fact that you've got that blueprint. So what I've done over the last 20 years is I've built a team of what I call subject matter experts. Welcome everybody to another episode of the Power Hour podcast. Uh, my name is Jeff Crudgenton, I'm your host. And today we've got a very, very special guest. Um, a legend in the industry. Uh, I'm not gonna, usually I say for those who don't know him, I'm pretty sure everyone's gonna know who this guy is. We've got Mr. James Carl. So thank you very much for joining us, James. Pleasure, Jeff, pleasure. Couldn't sleep last night. <laughs> I was super excited about a little chat today. I, I had to regulate the amount of coffee I was gonna drink because the excitement <laughs> was going to. Uh, so uh, for, just, 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 just to recap, because obviously a lot of people can know who you are, but maybe they've not known you know, the, the depth of what you've achieved. So James has exited 15 recruitment businesses that he's helped to build from scratch. Right? So he's the founder of the Recruitment Entrepreneur. Um, he's a global success. There's very, very few, I don't know any founders that have um, had that anywhere near the amount of success that James has had in the recruitment industry. Um, he's an expert at building, scaling companies and creating wealth with his partners. Um, James, in an industry where 90% of businesses are kind of between the five to eight person mark what separates you how, how do you achieve such success in this market um jeff i suppose like you i've met founders all over the world mm. and typically what we both find is a founder who's got five or ten years experience in the business they work for a particular business and they wake up in the morning and they say you know what? i want to do this myself and what I've seen, Jeff, is typically those people are good billers. Mm. And what I've learned throughout my career is just because you're a good biller does not mean you can build and scale a recruitment business. And more importantly, if you want to build a legacy, you want to build something of scale and you want to create wealth, you have to build an institutionally designed business that has infrastructure, corporate governance, proper board packs, proper set of accounts. It needs to have a proper management team. It needs to have a talent attraction specialist. It needs to have marketing function. Most founders, that is not what they've done before. What they have done is they've been really good with clients. They've been really good at winning business. But all of those things of the ingredients of scale is not their area of specialism. So typically they do what they're very good at, which is they win a bit of work, they win some fees, they hire a couple of people they know, friends of theirs, people they work with. They generally get to that kind of five to eight mark and then it stops. And then they don't really go any further. So what I've done is because of my experience with Alexander Mann, which today has become the world's most successful talent solutions company on the globe, the business employs over 7,000 people, operates in 22 countries, and has revenues in excess of 1.6 billion. Having had 
the opportunity and the experience of creating and building that business has given me a sense of experience and knowledge, which is what I use with the founders that I work with. So I've been in an environment where I've had to build something of scale. I've had to make those mistakes. I've had to learn from experience of how you navigate from a boutique business to a scale business with institutional processes. So when I meet a founder today that has that motivation, that ambition, that drive, that wants to build something, I'm working with him, coaching and mentoring him to be able to break the mold of boutique and create something of scale. Mm -hmm. And to be fair, Jeff, it's not easy because as we know in the business, developing a brand and developing a legacy and having that social media presence, having that brand identity, having that go-to-market strategy is not something that's easy because we are in an incredibly crowded market today. Mm -hmm. So having that marketing and branding capability isn't something that most founders have. So what I've done over the last 20 years is I've built a team of what I call subject matter experts so over the years, I've kind of worked with, met with, and now successfully managed to bring on my team. So I have a marketing team and a marketing function that I employ as a full-time function. So when I back a founder, I have a marketing team, I have a sales team, I have a corporate governance team, I have an IT team, I have a finance team, I have an operations team, and I also have an M&A team that works with the founder. When we get to a position of exit, we know the market, we have relationships in Australia, Asia, US and Europe. So when the business gets to a size where we think this has now got intrinsic value, my corporate finance team, which sits within my private equity business, networks throughout the market to find who those potential buyers are. So I work with my founders typically between four and seven years and take them through that whole journey. But the truth is, it's not just me. I've got 18 people now who I work with. And as soon as I back somebody, that 18 strong team becomes the management team of my founder. Mm -hmm. So as he's growing that business, rather than trying to second guess, what does my website look like? What's my social media strategy? What's my branding on LinkedIn? He works with my marketing team who shows him how to do that. When he's in a position where he's trying to attract talent, rather than trying to make it up himself, he works with my talent team that says, what are you looking for? What are you gonna pay? How are we gonna attract them? What's gonna separate us apart? How do we attract the right people? What do we pay them, etc." If he then wants to go to market strategy in terms of the customers, where are we targeting? Is it nationally, is it internationally? Is it contingent, is it retained? What end of the market are we gonna be? What is gonna separate us? So we have a dedicated team that works with the founder on that. You know, what about IT? What about operations? What about training? What about HR? So in every one of those areas, I have somebody who does that for a living. So when the founder has access to that, he has an ability to create something much more substantial. If he tried to do that on his own, to be blunt, it's quite difficult to do. It's extremely difficult to do. And I think that you know, from a rec to rec perspective, I deal with loads of clients all day long. It's my, my job to speak to loads of people. And I feel very lucky because I'm constantly learning about what works and also what doesn't quite work. And I always find that, you know, you, you'll have a particular consultant, for instance, and they'll do really, really well at a particular business. And then they'll move to another business and they'll fail. And <clears throat> I've learned over the years to be able to spot that before that happens, because it's kind of this person's flourishing this recruitment consultant, for instance, is flourishing, but look at the commercial platform that they've got. Look at the, you know, as you say, look at the, what's marketing bringing in? What's talent attraction bringing in? Um, you know, uh, what sort of recruitment technology are they using? You know, so they've, they've been given all of the tools to succeed. And then you move them to like a smaller boutique business where they're given a desk and a phone and, and they ultimately can't flourish. And I liken that to what you've just mentioned, where it's like, for instance, with, I can, I can, the, the experience I can really talk from the heart from is my own experience. And, you know, previously 
as you mentioned, I was a good biller. Um, so I never quite got the million, but I got 860 one year. Um, and I was always an independent person, kind of individual contributor, never built a team, never managed a team. And so when I went out on my own, my first endeavour was, like what you say, let's build something of legacy. Let's, you know, I'm going to be the biggest rec agency in the world. And I looked at what needed to happen for that. And once I got to four or five people, I realised, I'm not very good at management, <laughs> right? <laughs> and uh, what I'm really, what, what's happening here is, is that rather, and then, but since then, obviously I've done loads of recruitment training. I, I, I've again got the privilege of having a lot of recruitment trainers in my network and they've told me, they've taught me how to be a billing manager, for example. And now rather than it being five people divided by me, it's five people to the times of, of me, if that makes sense. So I've clocked that, but it's been a very, it's been a very hard process. It's been a very slow process. And um, I know that's kind of slightly away of what you were saying, but it's I can see it from a recruitment consultant perspective of, you know, what what platform have you got? So if you're a recruitment founder, if you're considering to become a recruitment founder, these are all the areas that maybe people are not quite understanding what they need fully, because a lot of time people there's no there's no courses, is there? There's no it's kind of like, as you mentioned, you've done really well in recruitment. Well done. You know, you're billing quite a lot of money. Go out and do it on your own. But as you mentioned, there is a formula, there's a blueprint. And, you know, and, and the, the thing I've noticed about dealing with your business uh, and the people within your business is that they're very, very good quality uh, employees that you've got. Like, it's always a pleasure to deal with. Like some of the people that we've had to speak to uh, to get this podcast arranged and previously um, when I was working with you as a group, um, they're high class individuals. They know what they're doing. They're really, really good at what they do. Um, so I think that the the, the question that I'm leading on to really is that do you feel like that there is a there is a specific time in someone's career where they should start looking at the option of becoming an entrepreneur and starting their own recruitment business? Is there an optimal area? So if you compare that, Jeff, so if you if you come in what I call the conventional world, in the conventional world, you join a company and you know, you join as a biller and then you grow to management and then you become an area manager, regional manager, regional director. And typically, Jeff, it takes about 15 years in a normal company, not necessarily recruitment, to learn the skills of how to run a business. Mm -hmm. So if you imagine in a conventional firm, if you joined, it would take you roughly 15 years to be in a position to, to become the MD of a business. Mm -hmm. Then you compare that to our industry, so we're a recruitment guy, we're a team leader, we're a manager, and we decide we want to run on, on our own, and we set up on our own, and we've gone from zero to being MD in 10 minutes. Mm. Now, that's why 90% of the market never makes it, because they're making that jump too quickly, because in a normal organization, you would have gone through a management career path. Where you've gone from billing, you become a team leader, you become a manager, then you maybe become, you know, the kind of general manager, you're now running the operation, now you've got the operations person working for you, become a director, now you've got the finance function reporting into you, got the HR function reporting into you, and now you're making wider decisions across the business, not just on your desk. Mm -hmm. And eventually, 15 years later, you become the MD. But at that point, you've gone through the entire navigation of the business, the company, etc you've run all the different functions, you've experienced yourself in all those different areas, but when you set up on your own and you haven't gone through that journey, that's why it's impossible to scale because you haven't built a back office function, you haven't you know, ran an IT department, you haven't managed the HR person, you haven't managed you know, the sales director. So the truth is you can just make it up as you go along. That's why businesses don't scale, because the, the founder, it's not that he's not good, he's just never done it before. Mm. And it's just quite difficult. So within Recruitment Entrepreneur, I don't have what I call generalists. I have what I call specialists. These are subject matter experts of people who, that's all they've ever done. And therefore, their skill set in that specific area is exceptional. So when my founder wants to build his back office function, what software should he use, what accounting system should he use, 
you know, how do they do collections? How do they monthly management accounts? How do they reporting? What KPIs to track? My talent team works with them on what are we looking for? What are we going to pay him? How are we going to hire him? You know, what's his 90 day plan? What's the management strategy? What's his career path? You know, all of these things that exist in the, you know, in the larger groups that obviously don't exist in our founders business, but they are the backbone of scale. So the challenge the founder has is he couldn't hire one of the subject matter experts that I have because they're too expensive for a small business. Mm. Whereas I'm spreading their cost, you know, across, you know, maybe 20, 30 businesses. So the economies of scale allow me to attract that person. Mm. But if I was a founder with a three man business, not one of those individuals would want to come and work for me because there's not enough to do and I'm probably too expensive. So I have exceptional people that work with the founders, but their cost and their expertise is spread across a number of businesses, which give them the value of why my businesses tend to do slightly better than the market. Because the one lesson I've learned, recruitment is all about people. We are only as good as the people we have mm -hmm. and our ability to scale is entirely dependent on the expertise of the people around us. If we don't have that, we are handicapped. Mm. And by, by joining Recruitment Entrepreneur, you've got instant yeah. access to those, you know, top crack team of experts, right? And so you can scale easier. So, okay, so so you've got a general blueprint that you have you implement and it's, you know, it's robust and it's it, it works regardless of sector, Obviously, things need to be adjusted and whatnot. So ultimately, the answer to that question is, is that the reason why most businesses don't, you know, if they if they if they intend to, but they find difficulty in passing that kind of like five to eight uh, man team is because they just don't have expert access to the individuals that they need to be able to make that a reality. Yeah, and I think what what stops people doing that, Jeff, is people want to do it themselves. And they say, I want to own the business. I want to be 100% owner. If you look at most businesses today, very few businesses that succeed are ever owned 100% by the founder. Every unicorn business has investors in the business. Every business I come across that truly grows has had a number of investors been part of that journey. And what those founders recognize is you can do it yourself and you can own 100%. But the really stark truth is it's 100% of nothing because it's unlikely ever to be worth anything. So are you better off? You know, so if you take Amazon today, you know, Jeff Bezos probably owns less than 10% of it. You know, most businesses that scale generally have to raise capital. And they generally, you know, give up equity to raise the capital. But those founders are not obsessed with owning 100%, what they're obsessed with is growing a business that has a value. And therefore, I'd much rather own a smaller percentage of a business of value than 100% of something that probably is never going to be sold or is never going to have a value. So I think the market is split into two areas. You've got a chunk of the market where founders believe it's all about, I need to, I need to be in control, I need to have 100%, and I want to put my own capital in. And I would say 90% of the founders that I meet are what I call undercapitalized. They start with too little and they don't have the working capital to grow. So they're, they're kind of almost handicapped before they start. When I work with a founder, I invest directly in the business and make sure he has the capital to grow. Mm. Because if he doesn't have the capital to grow and he's struggling to, to pay himself or make a living, business will never grow. So the first thing I do is make sure there is enough investment in the business to achieve the ambition and goals of the founder. I then ensure that it has the right management team available to the founder to fill in the gaps that he has not had experience in and give him a fair chance of success. That's the difference. So when I meet many people, and I do lots of people who say, but James, you know, I need to control the business. I want to own 100%. And I say, there's nothing wrong with that, but just look at the market and look at successful businesses. How many successful businesses grow where the founder has never taken external investment 
The answer is hardly ever. Every successful business I've ever met, the founders have to raise capital in order to grow and achieve the scale that he wants. Founders rarely ever have that much capital available to do that. So if you're going to own 100%, chances are you're never going to scale. Mm. Yeah, so like, as you said, I mean, obviously I come across a lot of people. Um, you know, I've met I've met people that have started in their bedroom and they've gone off and um, you know made loads of money. But I would say that that's extremely extremely rare. And the majority of people that I've seen that have built big big businesses, as you say, have either taken investment or you know a part of something like yourself. And and another good point as well, which you mentioned about building something, because uh, that that's another thing, isn't it? When people um, you know. Uh, start to venture out on their own the idea is a lot of the time you know a lot of time is i'm going to have this business for five years and then i'm going to sell it i'm going to become a multi-millionaire and i'm going to you know go and go off into the sunset which again you know very rarely does happen but also people sometimes when they go to exit they realize that there's not as much money in the exit as what they thought there might be and there's loads of variables in the exit right and another benefit that i would imagine that you would have is that you've got the option to group two or three businesses together and sell them as a as a as one entity, and then all then you know your multiples would be would be higher. Is that something that's also a benefit of working with you, James? Or I'm yeah, not... so I think there are two two sides of that, Jeff. One, you're right. Every founder I meet says to me, you know, in the next three to five years, I'm going to exit. And what I always say is, what are you going to exit to whom? Mm. And they don't really know the answer to that question either. So what is it you're going to build and what you're going to build? Is there a market appetite for that? Mm. Is there a demand for that? Because maybe there is and maybe there's not. So how much clarity do you have of knowing what the market wants? So when I'm building a business, because I've sold already 15, I know what the market wants. I know mm. what the market will pay. I know the sectors that they want to be in and I know who the buyers are. So I have a really good network in Asia. So I have a partner who works with me in Japan and he covers the Asia market. So he covers Singapore, Hong Kong, Japan, and China. I have another partner of mine in Australia who covers that region. I have a really strong connection in America. So he covers the US market and my private equity firm, Hamilton Bradshaw covers the European market. So when I have a business to sell, the first thing I do is reach out to my network. And this network, Jeff, has taken me 20 years to build. Mm -hmm. So I physically have traveled all around the world, developing those relationships, developing those connections, so that when I do have a business for sale, you know, I'm not, I'm not sort of spraying and praying. I kind of know exactly where that appetite exists. So that's the first thing. Knowing where the market for the buyer is and who that buyer is, and typically, what does that buyer want and what will he pay for? You know, does he want search? Does he want contingent? Does he want retained? Does he want contract? Does he want RPO? You know, does he want financial services? You know, what does the market want? And what will it pay for? Having sold so many, I also, as you rightly say, it's not about where you sell a recruitment business and the, found, the buyer writes you a check and you go off into the sunset. The first thing to remember is very, very few buyers will buy your business without you. Mm. So you never go off into the sunset is the answer mm. because you are a significant ingredient in the business. So every business I have ever sold in my life, the most critical thing the buyer wants is the founder. Mm. So the first thing will happen is you will be locked in and tied into that agreement where you will need to retain yourself in the business for at least a three year period. Whatever valuation that you get in the business, you're never going to get 100% of that day one because the buyer typically will not risk writing you a check and you leaving because if you do, typically the business will fall apart. So A, you're generally going to expect to be signed up for a minimum of three years and B, you will get anywhere between 50 and 70% of the value today and the balance you'll probably get over three years. So there is always a structure in recruitment where the buyer typically wants to protect himself because the, the one thing we have to remember 
is what is he actually buying? He is buying a group of people. Mm. You know, by the way, and they walk out the door every night. So every transaction, either the down, the buyer spends a lot of his time protecting what he's buying to make sure the team remains in place, the founder remains in place, because if any one of those people leave, it has a direct impact on the earning capability of that business. So the reason why you rarely ever get all of the capital today is because if you did, what motivation do you have to show up the next day mm. and carry on billing? If you just bank the check for 10 million. So mm. there's always a kind of a structure around the purchase. And because we have our own in-house M&A team, we work with the founders and we educate them to understand what does exit look like? What does a sale look like? What is likely to happen? What are you likely to get? What kind of lock-in period will you have? And how does it work? Mm. Because the truth is very few founders have ever experienced that. And because we've done so many now, um, we're about to announce, Jeff, probably in the next 10 days, another sale. So we have a founder that we backed five years ago. It was a husband and wife team. They came to me. They said, look, I want to set up on my own. Uh, would you back us? They wanted to do accounting and finance. We backed the business. And over the last five years, we've taken the business from zero to about 12 consultants. Uh, the business does about two and a half million net fee income, makes about half a million profit. And we got approached three months ago by somebody in America who <clears> wanted <throat> to expand their accounting and finance practice. So it's an established business in the US, uh, been around for kind of 20 years. They want to now expand into the European market. They were looking for a platform to get into the UK market. They approached us and said, look, Europe, an established player in the market. Do you have a business that might fit that spec? We happen to have a business that was in accounting and finance that had, you know, 12 people, a profitable business. They met the founder. They got on really well. They liked the market. They liked the customer base. They liked the, the kind of level of fees we were operating in. They made us an offer. We accepted. And we've just spent the last 12 weeks on the due diligence, the legals, the financials, um, making sure that, that, that the company is exactly what they think it is. It's got no liabilities. You know, the, the customer base is solid. The people are solid. And we actually closed that transaction on Monday. So the money was wired. The, the deal was signed Monday. The, the money was wired Tuesday. And this morning, my founders got on a plane and they're off to the US this morning to go and meet the management team and the operations team. And we're going to be announcing that on LinkedIn probably in the next 10 days. Well, how many people would like to switch with them right now? Be on that plane <laughs> on the way there, you know, big fat check on the other side of it. That's lovely. And the other thing as well is, is you mentioned about the due diligence period, which a lot of people obviously... So <clears throat> my, my experience in this industry has is, is been over quite a long time. And I, as I, I always mention, I, I'm in love with recruitment. It's not that like I love what I do. I'm in love with recruitment. It saved me from a, <clears throat> a life where... It was, you know, not going well. Recruitment was my lifeline. And um, I think I mentioned this to you before, but many years ago, we was in a little one-bedroom flat with my uh, missus and my kid then. And um, my friend used to stay around with me, a guy called Daniel Doolin, and we used to watch you on Dragon's Den. <laughs> <laughs> and we was very, very skin, right? I'm not a billionaire now, but I'm far from where I was then, right? And so is he. And, uh, you know, that, that kind of story you've just mentioned there, that was the kind of story we imagined was going to happen to us one day, right? On the way to New York, uh, you know, to pick up a big fat check and meet our new business partners. And um, I know you've recently come back from uh, New York, which I'd like to get to in a minute. But what, I've, what, I've, um, what the point I was making is, is that um, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of on the inside of a lot of recruitment founders. I've, I've, I've worked with them for many years. I've built that trust with them. And because they know I'll speak to a lot of other people, I get quite a lot of credibility between them, right? And so a lot of times when they're, when they're about to sell or they want to sell, um, we have conversations. And during that, due, so let's say, for instance, that same um, scenario happened and, you know, that they do two and a half million, they've got 500K profit at the end. They'll go and they'll get a, a deal struck up 
right? With somebody and, you know, it's all looking good. And then during that due diligence process, they, the buyer lot does not like some of the things that they uncover. And it goes back again to the fact that you've got that blueprint of what people want to see and how, uh, uh, you know, what's your, what's your split between contract and perm, for instance? And, you know, what are your processes in regards to like, what are your recruitment processes? How do you gain clients? All these sorts of stuff that they do dig into, don't they? Not, it's not just the, it's not just, it's not just a figure, it's how you arrive to the figure and how what's the strength of that figure and can it be, are you working to a system? Is there a process? What's your infrastructure like? And all the stuff that I imagine that by linking in with recruitment entrepreneur, you can just take for advantage, you just take an advantage, but you know, building it yourself is it's bloody hard. It's bloody hard to get right. And sometimes, even though even when you think you're on the other end. I've seen it loads of times where people feel like they're at the finish line and then they've got to go back and implement loads of stuff in order to actually get the sale through. I think you make a really, really good point, Jeff, an, an exceptionally good point, because you are absolutely right. Most founders that I have met, what they believe is as soon as I've hit half a million or a million profit, I'm ready to sell. Mm. What they probably haven't realized is the profit number is only one of nine constituent parts of value. Mm. Just because you've got a million profit does not mean the business is saleable. Mm. So the first thing the buyer wants to understand is what is the productivity per head in the business? And if your productivity per head, even having made a million profit is 8,000 a head, he's probably not gonna buy the business because your productivity level is just too low. That's a reason not to buy it. He'll then look at, what is the concentration risk in the business? And maybe to get to that profit of million, you've got four dominant pillars. Well, he's not going to buy that either because he's going to think to himself, if two of them left, my profit's going to fall off a cliff. So I've got a concentration risk with just two fewer founders or two fewer pillars. Then he's going to look at your customer base and say, three of those customers represent 55% of the GP. He's not going to buy it either because if two of those customers moved, the company will just collapse. Mm. So he's not going to buy it either. He's then going to look at the conversion rate and say, what percentage of the gross margin do you convert into profit? If you're only converting at less than 10%, your cost base is too high. Mm. He's not going to buy it either. So there are nine different things we have learned over the 15 businesses we've sold, where we know buyers immediately focus on these issues. And if we have a business that does not meet that criteria, we don't take it to market because we know we're either going to get a low ball valuation or no buyers. Mm. So as we're nurturing the founder, as we're working with him, we're very mindful of those constituents of value. And we educate the buyer day one and our founder so he understands that to get value, to build wealth, he needs to deliver those metrics. So right now, I probably have about 20 businesses that I am working with. And, you know, all of them have some issues. So some are doing really well, but their productivity is too low. Some are doing really well, but their conversion, they're only converting at 8%. You know, some are doing really well, but their productivity per head's too low. So each business we are very focused with to ensure that we are addressing those constituents of value. And only when we get the constituents of value to that level, would we want to go to market because we're not in a hurry to sell. We're not desperate and we don't want to give it away. Mm -hmm. So we will only bring it to market when we can tick those boxes. But I get many, many founders reach out to me on LinkedIn and say, James, I've got a great business. I've been going for 10 years. I'd like some advice and you know making a billion profit and when i spent half an hour and i focus on my constituents of value 90 percent of the time even though it's a profitable business it's not saleable mm. because i know that every single business i have ever sold the buyer typically will hire a grant thornton and ernst and young one of the accounting firms who typically will come in and do between three to four weeks of due diligence where they're completely focused on these issues. And if they identify the business does not have those drivers, they will write a due diligence report to the buyer, giving their 
recommendations, which are generally, this is not something to buy because the risk is too high. And by which time the founder has wasted six months of due diligence and travel and backwards and forwards, etc. During that period, he's probably not billing very much because he's a bit distracted. And then he ends up six months later, there is no deal. The buyer walks away. And I would say every year, there's probably around 200 businesses that come to market and maybe, maybe 5% or 10% may sell, 90% never actually conclude because of this reason. Mm. Exactly what you said, because mm. they will do due diligence. Nobody's going to write you a check blind. Mm. Every buyer I have ever met in my life is what I call a sophisticated buyer. They know what they're doing. They've done it before and they're generally quite a sizable business mm -hmm. and they will all, especially if it's a private equity firm, they will all hire external advisors and those external advisors will advise the client and they will look at what we call nine constituents of value. And if the business cannot tick those boxes, there generally is no sale. Mm. And, and that's the thing, you know, if, if look, I just think that if, if you're if you're thinking about um, if you're thinking about starting a recruitment business or maybe you've started one and you know it's not going where you want it to be, and it's actually something that you do want to do, you do want to exit. I think it's an absolute no brainer to 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 be calling you because you know exactly what it is that you're building towards. So you're not if you're in five years time, you feel like you've you know all of a sudden it's like I've I've made a million profit now. I've done everything I said I was going to do, but from the beginning you didn't know what it was that you needed to do in order to sell that business. You, your your idea is that you get to a million, but as you said, there's eight other sections that you need to be ticking and you're not building towards that. Had you have had that knowledge in the beginning, then you've got half a chance. But if you've not got awareness about what it is the market wants, you ain't got a chance. Like for me, I know exactly what my, my market want. They want stable people who have built a lot of money in their sector. If I can get them three things, I've got a deal. Right. Um, and it's, it's very similar, isn't it? I, I need to know what do I take to market to make money? And it's the same when you sell in a business. Um, so I'll give you an example, Jeff. I've just had somebody join Recruitment Entrepreneur in January. So this month. And it's a chap called Josh. And really, really nice guy. Been in recruitment about 10 years. Uh, very, very successful career at Hayes. Consultant, biller, manager, grew a team, ran a team. Amazing track record, <clears throat> set up his own recruitment business seven years ago. So he's been a founder and entrepreneur for seven years. He's got the business to about 10 people now. I think he does about 1.3 million a year gross margin. And last year made 100,000 profit. So I met him last year and he said, look, I'm a bit frustrated. I've been doing this for seven years and I've got, you know, I've got a reasonable business. I'm making a living but I haven't been able to scale it. I can't get the productivity of the team. So every year, you know, half of them do well, half of them don't do very well. Mm. And I end up basically robbing Peter to pay Paul. So the guys I make money on fund the guys that are mediocre. So my profits never really grow. I'm probably the biggest biller in the business, but I'm only billing half of what I should be billing because I get so distracted with all the time I have to spend in the business and operations and finance and managing and training the guys and working with the guys so I can never build what I want to build. And because of that, <clears throat> I'm sitting here seven years later, the business has no value. I can't sell it because it's only making a hundred grand. So what am I going to do? So him and I have been talking between September and December. And, you know, I said, look, the challenge you're going to have, Josh, is if we're going to invest in you, <clears throat> you're going to have to give up equity. You're going to have to have a partner. So all of a sudden, it's now not just you. And we're going to have to institutionalize this business, which is different to how you built it before. So you're going to lose control. You're going to have a partner. You're not going to be 100%. So the first thing you've got to get over your head is giving up equity in your business. And he said, the problem is, James, the equity in my business today actually isn't worth anything anyway. So whilst they've got hundred percent, I've had it for seven years. I've, it's not come to anything. I'm, it's not got a value. No one's prepared to buy it. So I'm, let's be honest, I'm giving up a percentage of nothing. 
And, you know, you're right, if I join Recruitment Entrepreneur and I'm working in your environment and I'm working with other people, it's still my business. I'm still the CEO. I'm not reporting to those people. They're not my managers. You know, you know, they are effectively sector specialists. They're there to help me, navigate me, so that I don't get drawn into all of the things that, frankly, A, I'm not particularly good at, B, I don't enjoy. Mm. You know, so we've had numerous conversations and mentally he's kind of overcome that initial <clears throat> fear of giving up equity and coming into a group environment where, let's be honest, when people start their own, they want to get away from that. Yeah. They want independence. They want to do their own thing. He worked in Hayes. He had all of that infrastructure, <clears throat> but he's realized that without it, he's struggling. Mm. So he's literally joined us in January as now a founder within the Recruitment Entrepreneur family. And we're going to be introducing him on LinkedIn, but he's a good example of somebody that is what I call atypical of our market, been doing it for seven years, got a reasonable size, you know, doing 1.3 million a year, you know, good business, booty, good lifestyle. But the truth is it's going from a value perspective. There's no value, there's no wealth. And if I'm honest with you, he probably makes less today than he was making when he was a Hayes. Yeah, I mean, and you mentioned there about like the, uh, being part of the other recruitment. So I've been in your offices in Victoria and it is a, it's a really nice place to be and there's a lot of collaboration going on. So there's another, you know, I feel like I'm, I feel like this is a massive, on my part, it's not supposed to be a sales pitch, but I feel like it's, I'm doing a sales pitch, right? <laughs> uh, but, but, you know, I've experienced it and it's a, it's a brilliant thing that you've got there. Um, but I think it's mainly because in our, we've got about 30 founders. So what Josh is going to find is all of a sudden, rather than being on his own, there are 30 people like himself building a recruitment business that he will now become part of that ecosystem. Mm. We do events, we do what we call CO forums, and he'll now start participating in some of the events that we do, where he's interacting with other founders that are experiencing the same challenges as him, mm. that maybe are struggling to attract talent, or they want to go from contract to perm. How do I do that? There's another founder that's doing that. You know, I want to take my business international. How do I do that? This guy's doing 50% of his revenue in the US. How did you do that? So now he's part of a kind of a club with other founders that he can banter with, develop a relationship with, work together with, share clients. You know, so actually for him, it's been a very lonely life for seven years where effectively he's got nobody to talk to. And now he's part of a team of people very, very similar to himself who are on the same journey where you can share ideas, best practice, et cetera, that will transform his strategy on how he grows. And so this is just me thinking off the top of my head now. So like this, for instance, this guy that you've just taken on, right? So the other option that was available to him, maybe, you know, he may not have ever wanted to do this, but another option was, and, and it's, it's becoming more and more um, popular, I would say, or fashionable, I think would probably be the better word, is going like the solopreneur uh, route where they just think, right, I'm going to just become a principal consultant, but I'm going to be under a limited company and I'm not sharing my commission, right? So, you know, someone who builds 500K a year, for example, right, they're going to go and they're going to, you know, at the end of the year, their profit's going to probably be 450, obviously pre-tax and whatnot, right? So the operating costs are going to be much less than 50K, but let's just say they are. What do you think of that route? I understand that route doesn't obviously lend to your model, but have you got any, um, have you got any, um, oh, sorry, what's the word? What do you think of that route? I mean, <clears throat> there are, as you rightly say, there are many people who fit that, who basically are saying, look, I don't really want to build a business. I don't want to scale. I just want to keep more of what I build, you know, and I want to make a lot of money. There's, there's nothing wrong with that at all. And within Recruitment Entrepreneur, we have that model where we have about 25 people like that who are founders who have their own business, their own limited company, their own brand, but they sit within the recruitment entrepreneur network. We don't own a stake in their business. We don't invest in their business, but we provide them with all of the infrastructure, the back office, the financing, the VAT returns, the PAY returns, the statutory accounts. We do their invoicing. We do their collections. If they have a contract business, we do the payroll. So we provide all of that infrastructure 
which then allows the founder to do the one thing he's very good at, which is to mm -hmm. build. But he's not hiring people and he's not building a team and he's not doing constituents of value. All he's saying is, look, I'm building half a million a year. Today I'm making 150. You know, I want to double what I take. I want more of that net fee income to myself. Mm. And we say, perfectly okay. You don't need an investment. You don't need all of our scale model. What you really need is the back office so that you can pay your contractors, you can pay your invoices, you can collect your receivables, you can do your BAT returns, you can do the bank reconciliation, you can make sure you collect, because that in itself is quite a bit to do on that. Yeah. So we provide that, you know, it's like a, a recruitment entrepreneur express model that gives him all of the infrastructure without the headache of doing that himself. But he is what you describe a sole entrepreneur. And I think yeah. we've got about 25 of those now. I didn't know that you I didn't know you offered to do that because the other the other side of that is as well is that people are then foregoing the uh, infrastructure and the commercial platform that they're leaving behind and sometimes they don't understand how much they rely on that and they go out and they start on their own as a even though their idea is to just build on their own but they don't realize how much of their desk time is now going to be taken away of operational stuff which is boring and horrible for a for a person who just wants to build it's the opposite they want to do so, so they can still come and they can enjoy all of the infrastructure, the commercial platform, the camaraderie. And if they want to scale, if they decide, hang on a minute, I've done this for three or four years now and I've earned a bit of change. So, you know, I've done what I wanted to do. Now let's look at building something. Then they're in the right place, aren't they? Because they've Absolutely. Got... <laughs> and they've got all the equity. It's their business. It's their brand. You know, we're not taking an equity in the business, et cetera. So, you know, it's the best of both worlds. Yeah. And so we've mentioned a couple of times, come up a couple of times um, throughout the conversation about the US market. So I know you've recently just come back from New York. So um, just, just broadly, I know a lot of people are really looking at that's going to be a market that they want to chase in 2024. Loads of my clients are saying, you get anyone over there. A lot of people do it from here. Uh, so, you know, they're doing, they're doing m most of the time they're doing East Coast from like somewhere in the UK. I, I mainly do London. Um, and also some people want to actually build offices out there. Have you got an opinion on on that market as in, compa in comparison to the UK market? I mean, the US market um, is right now outperforming the UK market. A lot of it's because the US economy is doing better than our economy. So demand's very high. I do know we have offices in America, you know, they are definitely outperforming the UK. Uh, demand's good, job flow is very good. The other thing that I like about the US market is the US market, the fees are much better. Mm. You know, we've not done ourselves any favors in the UK. We've just consistently created too much internal competition where our fees have just got lower and people are, you know, they used to be 25% then 22, then 20, and somebody has started for 18. I'll do it for 15, I'll do it for 12. And <clears throat> the market's pushed itself down. In the US, they've done a much better job in holding their fees. So generally, you'll find your fees are much better. Job flow is much better. And by the way, it's a huge market. You know, it's 10 times. If you look at the US economy in comparison to the UK economy, it's massive. Mm -hmm. So you're obviously going to get more job flow. So there are a lot of people who are doing incredibly well both from sitting in the UK and placing in the US. But there are a lot of UK, I mean, when I was in the States recently, the number of UK recruiters I now meet in San Francisco, in LA, in New York, is unbelievable. Mm. You know, the market is really developed. And I would say that the UK is, is probably the biggest market that effectively moves across to the US. So if you're looking at either setting up an office there or doing business, the other thing to remember is our customer base today is truly global. Mm. The clients we do business with are not just UK centric. Mm. They have branches in the States. They have offices in the States. They have partnerships in the States. So the best way to navigate is to do it through your clients where you effectively expand into that market with your existing client base who has a foothold in that market. Mm. And you say, you know me, you work with me, you've seen the quality of the work I do. I can find you the same quality people in the US as I do in the UK. Mm. And because they trust you, they're more likely to work with you 
So we have found that the best way to do that is through the customer base rather than arriving there cold with nothing. Mm. Yeah, I agree completely. I mean, obviously, we've had conversations, and you was, uh, you know, very generous to uh, give me your exa- um, your uh, opinion on what I should specifically be doing, and that's kind of um, that's kind of the route that I went. So I've gone to companies that I've got long-standing relationships here in London, tried and tested, and it was as simple as giving them a call and saying, "I know you've got an office in New York. What are you looking for?" And it was literally that was the conversation. And then because I've got that relationship, it's like, oh, lovely, you're going to be doing that area as well. And yeah, I'm, I've not, I'm not an expert in it yet. I haven't got the book yet, but the processes and the and the systems are going to be the same. You know, what are you looking for? And, and then they give me, and then we've, we've had um, we've had some success in that touchwood. And also, what I've done is I've developed a different market. Whereas, as I mentioned, so there's a lot of people here that are focusing on, so in London, I, when I say here, I mean London. So a lot of people in London who are focusing on New York or Austin, for example, and I've managed to f- build up a little bit of a, of a network of those individuals that are here that are uh, working there and I've been placing them I've made a few placements um, last month for example with those people as well so I think that uh, and then we brought somebody from Canada who was working at um, Robert Waters in Canada we brought them to a, um, a tech recruitment agency here in London so it's worked the other way as well so I think that I agree with you completely my experience has been that the fees are bigger that, that that's mainly because as you mentioned you know, where there's less people out there, so not people are like fighting against each other for the fees. And, you know, I think that's always the last thing that you want to negotiate on. I, I charge 20% in London and 25% in, in America. That I can say that publicly because that's what I do. <laughs> you know, I don't I don't really negotiate on that, to be honest with you. Um, but it's not just the fees. It's also the fact that recruiters, for instance, are on, you know, 30, 35, 40K as an average base salary in London. And in New York, for example, they're on 75, 80. And they're talking about sort of senior consultants, senior consultants. So um, the salaries are bigger as well as the fact that the um, the fees, at the uh, the commission is bigger. So it's kind of like a double whammy. So it's, uh, and, and, it, and, it, and that's pretty much the same. I mean, uh, one of my friends started doing construction recruitment out there, site managers, they call them superintendents, I think. So, but site managers was on like sort of 70, 80, 90 here, or sort of, yeah, like 60, 70 here, and they were like 120 out there. So th- it's a great market, I, I think, personally. Um, and if you're doing the East Coast, you haven't really got to adjust your um, hours that much, but you just need to be willing to speak to people at 10 o'clock at night if you need to, you know, or, Absolutely. or, o'clock or midnight or whatever. So, yeah. Jeff, my time's run out. Yeah, I've got perfect. to jump on another call. Yeah, thank I've you I've so really much. enjoyed the conversation, Jeff. It was great to kind of chat to you. And, you know, I think anyone out there listening that wants to kind of reflect on our conversation and either wants to become a solo entrepreneur or wants to set up on their own or has an existing business that they really want to scale and build wealth, you know, feel free to reach out to me on LinkedIn. You know, I'm always available to have a chat. And if there's something that we can do together, when two plus two equals, you know, more than four, it's worth exploring. So lovely talking to you, Jeff. And I wish you every success. Thank you very much, James. Take Um, care. uh, Take care. Bye-bye. Bye.